Okie dokie, this is our second candidate conversation of the day. Very excited to be, to be bringing you this one, uh, the second of our double feature here. And I'm going to be typing in candidate conversations, Rebecca Parson. So Rebecca should be joining up any second. If you just missed that, uh, we just brought on uh, Joshua Collins, who's running for Congress in Washington's uh, 10th district. Now we are bringing on Rebecca Parson from Washington's 6th district. Somebody can probably tell me if I'm wrong on those numbers, but I hope that I'm not. Uh, do want to offer a couple things from Joshua that he just sent on over to me after our interview. Uh, he did mention... Uh, he says, I'm sorry, they do offer to fulfill internship requests for any volunteers because we were asked to do so multiple times. I'm asking for uh, clarification on that and also on getting his most recent uh, FEC reports. But in the meantime, very excited to be bringing you Rebecca Parson, who's running for Congress in Washington State's uh, Olympic Peninsula. That's like the side on the west of Puget Sound. Very excited to be bringing her to you. She is running a campaign affiliated, uh, a, a Democratic Socialist campaign or possibly Socialist campaign. We're going to check with her uh, in just a little bit. And we're going to be bringing her live to you. Whoa, where'd she go? So here she should come and we're going to ask her a bunch of questions. Um, very, very excited to be bringing her on. <laughs> Hi. Rebecca, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. Nice to be Thank here. you for joining me. I am very excited to be bringing you in. So let's, uh, let's kind of just get started. I just spoke to, uh, Joshua Collins, who's also running in Washington state. Now I get to speak to you. Mm -hmm. This is, I'm super glad we get to do like a double feature with both of them, Washington state. Yep. It's awesome. And Joshua and I actually, um, our districts are both in Tacoma, so we're in the same city, actually. Oh, amazing. We look like 10 minutes away from each other. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> Your district is centered on, uh, on, on the Olympic Peninsula, correct? Yeah, that's the largest uh, land area. And then I Got have um, the majority of Tacoma as well. Um, so, but yeah, I have the Olympic Peninsula, which has the uh, National Park, National Forest. It's a beautiful area. If people, if you Google like a PNW um, desktop or something, you'll probably, uh -huh. I mean, that's kind of what you're That's where it is. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Fantastic. All right. So, uh, I want to get into to asking you a couple exciting questions, but why don't we just start with, uh, Rebecca, talk to me about your candidacy. What inspired you to run for Congress? Yeah, well, so after 26, you know, I've always been involved with progressive organizing and activism, like straight out of college, I volunteered as a human rights observer with the Zapatistas and indigenous community in Mexico, did lots of other stuff over the years. Um, but in terms of the political process, I really just voted, paid attention to politics, but after 2016, wanted to get more involved. And so as I was you know, contacting our members of Congress, I would get back these form responses, especially from the incumbent, Derek Kilmer where, you know, these long responses, very polite, not really saying a whole lot, not committing to change anything. And I looked more into it and I found, wow, you know, we've been blue for 55 years and he's the 11th most conservative Democrat in the House. He calls himself a leader on getting money out of politics, but he's taken over $3 million from corporate PACs. He opposes Medicare for all and the Green New Deal. So I really decided to run for those reasons, especially with the 2030 climate deadline, I thought, you know, there's really not time. He's made it abundantly clear he's not going to change. So we need somebody who's going to run on Medicare for all and especially the Green New Deal. Your opponent, your opponents had every single opportunity to improve. He's this is a ridiculously safe district. This is a district yeah. that whoever <laughs> is the Democratic nominee is almost certainly going to win. So we might as well have somebody in this district who's going to be a fighter and a fighter for the people. You are aiming mm -hmm. to be that fighter. I want to ask you kind of what, what is your personal political, uh, political passion? What, what is something that if you were elected on day one, you'd be ready to fight for? National rent control, for sure. I'm mm -hmm. involved with tenants' rights organizing in Tacoma. I'm a renter. My rent's gone up a lot. Tacoma has one of the fastest rising rates of rent in the country. And there are people who, you know, an out-of-town developer will come in, buy a building, evict everybody, and then um, people will become homeless. And we have homeless people dying on the streets in Tacoma. And so I support uh, national rent control because one of the primary reasons that people become homeless is the rent is too mm -hmm. high, you know, it's doubled or tripled. And so I support national rent control so we can keep people in their homes. And then also a homes guarantee, which puts a lot of federal money into building more housing so that, you know, we have that cap and then we have money to build in the supply we need. 
I want to ask you a little bit about your personal history. Uh, I looked up on your website. Your father was a foreign service officer. Your grandfather was in the military. So you come from this line of people who were very much involved in these large institutions in the federal government, yet your, uh, your personal platform is very much diplomacy focused and very anti-war. What was your personal political genesis on that? Well, growing up with my dad being in the Foreign Service, I was around, mm -hmm. uh, and for anybody who's not familiar, because a lot of people haven't heard of the Foreign Service, yeah. uh, it's the uh, diplomatic core of the United States. And so it's a State, State Department. Department. If you're like overseas in another country, you lose your passport, you go to the embassy, you're dealing with a Foreign Service officer when you go to the embassy. And uh, they do a lot of other stuff besides that, but that's that would be the like your primary interaction with them. And so growing up with that, it's you know, I- It's such a cool about, job. <laughs> yeah, I found that, you know, the value of diplomacy was something that I was raised with. And so I really value mm. diplomacy over war. My grandfather was a colonel in the US Army, but he hated war. Uh, he, mm. you know, wanted to avoid it at all costs. I think you'll find that when you speak with many people who have been in wars, they don't, they don't like war, they want to avoid it at all costs. And so that's mm. what I want to do as well. And I think we really need to prioritize diplomacy over uh, military action, constantly invading other countries for oil. We also need to make sure that young people who um, their only option to, you know, have a decent life, a dignified life and housing and healthcare is not only the military, that's not their only choice. Um, and so that's part of, you know, what I'm proud of with the progressive platform as well is, you know, make sure everybody has free public college education and a guaranteed home, a guaranteed job. Um, that has something to do with our military uh, mm. adventures as well. One of the things that we talk about a lot in, I think, a lot of organizing spaces is uh, the draft hasn't been used since Vietnam because right now poverty is the draft because you get free mm -hmm. college when you exit the military. Uh, mm -hmm. But you shouldn't have to put your life on the line just to be able to go to college and try to create a better life for yourself and for your family. Um, so I, I want to ask you about the Green New Deal. You're, you support the Green New Deal. Your incumbent, uh, the person who already is in office, your opponent, doesn't support the Green New Deal. What makes you what makes you and what makes the Green New Deal better than your opponent? Well, the Green New Deal, you know, there's two two types of people who don't take enough action on climate change. Republicans who deny it and then uh, corporate Democrats who say, yes, it's real, but what we need to do is just do, you know, some tax credits to encourage people to, you know, mm -hmm. use, uh, buy hybrids or something like that. And it's like, okay, that's good. You know, that's a fine step, but it's a baby step compared to what we need to do. And what we need to do is radically overhaul the economy, get to 100% renewable energy by 2030. And it's almost uh, more dangerous to have somebody who says, yes, climate change is real. And what I'm going to do about it is this thing, when that thing is not nearly enough. It's just, you know, 1% one, uh, 1 of what we need to do. And so he, you know, he takes oil money. He says that he can't, you know, he, he refuses to stop taking oil money. He won't support the Green New Deal. And, you know, with this 2030 deadline to take you know, big radical change. We just don't have time for these baby incremental steps that the corporate Democrats take. And so I'm different from him on that. Um, unlike him, I support free public college and trade school, canceling student debt, canceling medical debt, um, single payer healthcare, which means you get healthcare whenever you need it without co-pays, deductibles, or premiums, support the Green New Deal, uh, rent control, and I don't take any corporate PAC or lobbyist money. Unlike him, he's taking over $3 million. <laughs> So... Let me ask you, uh, a lot of those policies sound excellent when you talk about them, but the question that uh, I get and that I'm sure that you get all the time is, how are we going to pay for it? Rebecca, how <laughs> are we going to pay for these big policies, Medicare for All, a Green New Deal, free public colleges and universities? How are we going to do it? Good question. And first of all, with uh, Medicare for All, that will actually save a lot of money compared to our healthcare system right now, overall. And then it'll also actually be cheaper for most people um, than what they're paying now in premiums. So it'll save the system money. And then also what we need to, we need to enact several types of taxes. One is a vacancy tax. So why do we have people sleeping on the streets when they're empty homes? Because a lot of rich people buy property and just park their wealth in it and don't use it for anything. Homes should be occupied. And if they're not occupied, people should have, have to pay a tax for the privilege of owning a home that is not homing anybody. 
And mm. then we also need to have a wealth tax. So the very wealthy pay on their capital gains also have a much more steep progressive income tax. So people who are millionaires, billionaires pay a lot more in income tax. Make sure corporations like Amazon are actually paying taxes instead of what they pay now, which is zero. And um, once we do that, we get a lot of the funding to pay for these things. But then also I always like to, I think coronavirus has really shown us that mm. people who ask you know, conservatives or centrist Democrats when they ask that, um, what do we see with the bailout? You know, the government was able to come up with $4 trillion to bail out corporations in Wall Street. Why can't Absolutely. they come up with that money to bail us out? Um, so it's really a matter, you know, we, yes, we can save money, we can institute these taxes, but also it's a matter of priorities. You know, the Fed created that money for the corporations and said, here you go, have it. They need to create it for us and give it to us. Let's talk about COVID-19 because your area and your state uh, of Washington was the first in the United States affected and uh, was in the beginning the most affected in the country. Big question that I think that I know your answer to, but did the president do a good job at handling the coronavirus <laughs> outbreak? And if elected, uh, or, or if you had been elected, what would you have been able to do to stop that? And what would you suggest that uh, the incumbent in your district, Derek Kilmer, should do right now? Big wide no, question, yeah. but go ahead and just spitball on, uh, spitball on coronavirus for me. Yeah, definitely. Well, Donald Trump handled it abysmally, and um, tens of thousands of people are dying because of his inaction, his denial of science, treating the government like a mob boss, like saying to the governors, well, I'm not going to give money or resources to those states because she didn't ask me nicely. Uh, you know that lady governor, she wasn't nice to me. Um, that's, I mean, that's how you run the mafia. That's not how you run the presidency or the federal government. It's ridiculous. And then, you know, having Mike Pence to go visit the Mayo Clinic without wearing a mask and saying he doesn't mm -hmm. need to. I mean, it's just thing after thing after thing, somebody just put a bunch of dollar uh, emojis. You know, what's happening is like a lot of these coronavirus treatments and um, contracts to build stuff are going to Trump cronies and donors and friends of his. Mm -hmm. So it's just, uh, I mean, it, 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 he's handled it extremely poorly and we're seeing the results right now. And not just people who are dying, getting sick, that's very serious, but also the healthcare workers they're being exposed and dying. There are nurses who are going to work in trash mm -hmm. bags because they didn't have PPE. Right. It's just the way he's been handling it is awful. Um, and the National Defense Authorization Act, um, that is something that can be used in a case of an emergency to require companies to produce certain goods. Uh, Trump said he would use it and then he didn't. I think that one thing Congress and my company can do is push him stronger to use that, actually fund it, mm -hmm. make sure it can be funded because you know if you're requiring companies to produce these things you've got to pay them um another thing that uh you know my opponent Derek kilmer can do is support health care for everybody you know like mm -hmm. a lot of the corporate democrats he says nobody should go broke because they have coronavirus well first of all what does that mean does that mean you're going to give them free care and then second of all should they go broke if they get cancer why is coronavirus different and so we need to have free health care free the point of service for everybody because otherwise we get this this like very um like fine print type of treatments. Like for example, in Washington state, the state said, okay, you can get free testing. Anybody gets free testing. But if you read the fine print, you would see that you did not get free treatment. So I was like, okay, so mm -hmm. I can find out that I have a deadly disease. Um, and then I get to just live with that knowledge until I die and just possibly because I can't you have nothing treatment. that you can do about it. Yeah. I want to ask you, uh, I want to ask you about this race, because this is obviously a race that whoever's the Democrat is going to win. And out of the three people who are currently running Democrats and Republicans, uh, you're in second place. Uh, the Republican uh, Elizabeth Kreiselmeyer? I have no idea how to pronounce that name. Uh, <laughs> you and the incumbent but when you look at you and the incumbent you are way behind on money uh your incumbents raised 1.4 uh, the incumbent who you're running against has raised 1.4 million dollars and has got three million dollars cash on hand uh in this cycle you've got you've raised 122 thousand dollars you have 35 grand on hand that's a big difference <laughs> how are you going to overcome that funding difference and, and how are you going to win this race? What's your path to victory here? Yeah, definitely. Well, um, first of all, he, I think once you get at beyond a certain point, it's almost like, what do you do with the money? And if you look mm -hmm. at his, I've looked at his FEC records, you spend it on, yeah. you know, retreats at golf courses and stuff like that. Um, and it starts to, you really start to have diminishing returns. It's like after you've had your 10th pizza of pizza, like what, it's not enjoyable. Anymore. You can't really use that much money. What are you going to need at that point? 
-hmm. Yeah, but it is a lot of money compared to what I have. Um, so the way I plan to win is by outworking him and also working smarter than him because these incumbents, especially Derek Kilmer, who's never been seriously challenged by a Democrat, um, they get used to not having to work hard for their seat. Um, they don't use their money uh, very wisely. And yeah, you know, they just don't, they don't work hard to keep it. And so before the pandemic, we were canvassing a lot. Now that we can't do that, um, we're phone making a lot. We're reaching a ton of voters. And what we found when we talked to people is that um, a lot of people just don't know what Derek Kilmer's up to, the votes he's taken, mm -hmm. the money he's taken, what he actually stands for and opposes. And when we talk to them, many people are easily persuaded. And so it's a lot like, you know, these other big races we've seen, you know, AOC is one, Card Eastman is another one in Nebraska. She just came very close to, to beating a Republican on a progressive platform in a Republican district. You know, yeah. uh, we've seen it in all these different races where you work really hard and use the money wisely. And thankfully, our fundraising is still increasing. We actually beat, uh, so in April, we beat the previous month by $10,000. So thankfully, wow. even though a lot of people are facing hard times during the pandemic, they're still um, generously donating. And you can also donate if you're over 18 to Rebecca's campaign if you're feeling inspired. Actually, why don't we have you, uh, we're not done quite yet, but why don't we have you plug uh, how you can donate and how you can get involved real quick yeah, if you're feeling thank inspired. You. <laughs> I'm always inspired to ask for donations because <laughs> it is tough. I'm running against a guy who has a lot of money and I don't take any corporate packer or lobbyist donations. Uh, last time I checked, my average donation was like $26. Um, Every dollar counts. You know, we're doing a ton of phone banking, which is more expensive than canvassing where you just send volunteers are going to the doors because we have to pay for all, we have to buy all the phone numbers. We have to pay for every dial. So even if you can just give a dollar, that helps because that funds 18 phone calls to talk to voters. Wow. You can go to Rebecca for WA.com to do that. R-E-B-E-C-C-A-F-O-R-W-A.com um, to donate. And then I also am on Rebecca, at Rebecca for WA on Instagram, of course, uh, Twitter and Facebook. Can we slide in your DMs if we if we don't know how to get involved? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> Thank awesome. you. Awesome. And we okay. accept. Um, we have a really active internship program. Uh, high schoolers and college students. If anybody's interested, please send an email to Pamela at Rebecca for WA .com. We have about fifty interns right now, and they do meaningful work. We have even a fifteen-year-old on our policy team who's writing policy, and I review it. I decide wow. what to do. But yeah, wow. This is amazing role. You can really contribute, even if you're in high school, if you're in college. Um, so I really encourage people to apply. You'll get to work with progressives all over the country. Rebecca, can I ask you, do you pay your interns? I don't, but we give them a uh, college credit. And then we also uh, make sure that they spend 50% of their time. So we don't do any like grunt work for interns. And they get to spend mm -hmm. at least 50% of their time in an area like a policy or like a fundraising lead, something like that, where um, at the end they can have a real title, like, you know, policy lead to put on their resume or something like that. I see. I see. Do you think that that's something that shouldn't have to happen, that, that there's, that you should be able to have all of your interns be paid? Where do you yeah, stand kind I, of ethically on that issue? Yeah, I really think that it, I would prefer to be able to pay interns. Um, and I think that we need to, part of the reason I want to get into Congress is to enact a public financing system where, you know, I don't have to spend six hours a day dialing for dollars, like calling potential donors and asking, cold calling them and asking them for money. And what we can also do is have it be an even playing field and, um, <laughs> just reading the comments, have an even playing I'm field. I'm getting bullied for that. like my hair. There's nothing I can do. I haven't had a haircut <laughs> in like two your months. Fine. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so something I plan to do when I get into Congress, absolutely, is like uh, like AOC has done, like other member progressive members of Congress have done, is pay the interns, especially because for an internship in Congress, you have to actually go to D.C. And so what you do when you don't pay your interns for a job that you have to actually move to is it means that only um, mostly only wealthy and privileged people can do the internship. And that just perpetuates the cycle because a lot of the time interns will go on to careers in politics or they'll run for office themselves. And if you wanna have people from all different backgrounds, races, sexual orientations, all kinds of like all kinds of representation, you need to open that up. And so I will absolutely pay interns in Congress so that they can actually, anybody can come, they can pay for their rent, they can pay for their clothes and their food while they're there. 
Right now, the campaign is so strapped that I can't pay all the interns, right. but try to make up for that by giving them really meaningful roles and not, uh, you know, I've been in places where interns was like, okay, your job is to just get us coffee. That's not what we do mm -hmm. on the campaign. <laughs> I will say I was a congressional intern, so I was I was <laughs> I was waiting to see what you said because I was an unpaid congressional intern back uh, last mm -hmm. summer, um, and and you're completely right. The field of interns that exist is whitewashed. It's all wealthier people, myself included. I sit in that exact same pocket. So I joined a group of interns who were lobbying members of Congress and the very members of Congress that they worked for uh, to include universally paying interns a $15 an hour minimum wage, which on its own would open up the world of politics uh, and working directly in the halls of power to so many more people. Um, yeah, I want to ask you, and, and, and also I, I'll, I'll give you some serious props here because as far as, uh, as far as candidates paying their interns and not being able to pay, uh, pay their interns, your campaign is a little strapped for cash. So again, donate. Uh, but you're also <laughs> able to give really serious, uh, really immediate answers on exactly what you're doing uh, because you can't pay your interns. So huge props to you on that. Um, I want to ask you very directly, uh, how have people in your district been involved, uh, been affected by climate change? Uh, and how will they be uh, affected by climate change? And what will the Green New Deal do to stop that? Yeah, we've been affected in a lot of ways. So here in Tacoma, where I live, we had a couple summers ago, there were wildfires in British Columbia, Eastern Washington, and we actually had um, ashes from these wildfires like miles and hundreds of miles away um, coming in, coming in over the, the wind currents. And then actually we had for a long time just literally ashes falling from the sky, which is pretty post-apocalyptic. It's like something from a movie. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one thing because wildfires are just getting uh, more and more intense, happening more frequently with climate change. So even though here we're in a rainy you know, wet area, um, the wildfires in other places affect us. And then on the Olympic Peninsula, which is more rural and is mm -hmm. beautiful, we, there are a lot of tribes living on the coastline there and they've lived there forever since time immemorial. There's archeological evidence of um, those tribes living there for thousands of years. And they're having to leave behind places they've lived all that time and move like an entire village farther upland because of rising sea levels. and. Another thing, particularly the Macaw Nation, which is in my district, and if you picture, you know, a map of the lower 48 and mm -hmm. the very, you know, tip, top, you know, northwesternmost tip, that's where the Macaw yeah. Nation is. I and their, their school is in a tsunami zone. And tsunamis with rising sea levels, that's a, da a danger. And because of lack of funding, their evacuation plan for that school is for the kids to just um, stand up and run a mile uphill. So, you know, having wow. kids outrun a tsunami, that's, that's not an adequate plan. And so that's, that's a climate change issue. Then also mm -hmm. in Aberdeen, which is um, one of the most struggling parts of the district, any uh, Kurt Cobain fans, he was from Aberdeen. Um, I was canvassing there in a low income area. I spoke with somebody who said that every time uh, the river floods, which will happen more and more with rising sea levels, mm -hmm. um, trash comes up from the sewage onto the sidewalks around the camp complex. So these are real, you know, issues. We really need climate change. Yeah. Wow. Climate change um, I want to ask you, no, that's an amazing answer. I, I want to ask you about uh, one last question before we kind of start wrapping up here. And I ask you my question that I ask everyone about the 15 year old who lives next door to me, uh, who I'm almost certain doesn't watch these live streams and has no idea that I'm talking about him, but he is real. Uh, he actually is that <laughs> I just I saw the question on the last one that, and I was like and I was like pointing over there which is where my window is but actually I was just thinking about it he lives over there. Anyway, um how do you plan to serve the low income and the undocumented uh cast of uh of uh people of your district? So for uh low income people um policies like um free public college so that anybody can go to college, free public, free um, trade school and community college. I think that's extremely important. Uh, we need to also, there are a lot of uh, low income seniors. That's something a lot of people don't realize. A lot of seniors mm. live in poverty because the average benefit is $1,200 a month. 20% of my district is seniors. And so we need to not only protect social security, but expand it um, by, it's called scrapping the cap. And it just means like, 
making sure that rich people um, pay into Social Security on their entire income, and not just the first $100,000. So that would take care of um, seniors. Then we also need to expand, um, expand food stamps. No kid should be going hungry, especially now during coronavirus. They can't go to school where many kids get to their meals. That's extremely important. In terms mm -hmm. of protecting people who are undocumented, um, I think that we need to ban private prisons across the country, whether they're for um, caging American citizens or undocumented um, people. And we have in Tacoma one of the largest private immigration prisons in the country. And I think that um, having private prisons at all is a totally perverse incentive. It results in terrible treatment and makes the companies want to lock up more and more people. And I also think we need to stop locking up people who are undocumented um, if they don't have a violent criminal offense. Um, there is, it's not keeping us safer. The only thing it's doing is enriching the operators of these prisons. It's keeping people away from their families. Um, so that's something I would support as well. Alrighty, and then of course, the big question. There's a kid who lived, he actually lives that way. Uh, <laughs> there's a kid who lives next door to me. Why should he get involved in your race? And why should he care? Well, something that a high schooler told me when I was um, speaking with them before the internship was they said, you know, they felt powerless because they couldn't vote. And all these decisions were being made for them that they had no impact on and they couldn't change. And so I don't know why I'm getting all these Shrek questions. <laughs> I'll ask it. I'll ask it in a minute. Sorry. <laughs> Um, and so they really feel powerless. And I think if you are under 18 and you can't vote and you're seeing all this stuff going on, and you're seeing politicians take oil money, not addressing climate change, you're thinking like, when I'm 30, what world is there going to be for me? One way that mm -hmm. one thing you can do is get involved in a campaign like mine um, and help us and help make a difference. That's something you can really do. And then I think also, you know, why I care about my campaign? I actually listen to, you know, the there's a 15 year old on my campaign who I did a Reddit live, uh, Reddit AMA, and we were on like a Skype call and she was sending me stuff to make sure I didn't miss it. She was like act mm -hmm. act not missing any AMA questions. She was actively managing it, suggesting things to say, like really taking an active role. Yeah, you can be an intern even if you don't live in Washington. Um, and so you, you can take an active role, you can make a difference even if you can't vote. And also just in terms of like, what do you want that what do you want in like in 10 years America to look like? What do you want the climate to be like? Um, it, you need to support candidates, whether it's me or somebody else, but um, you know, on the brand new Congress slate or somebody like Joshua, like the incumbents that people were running against, they really are not taking enough action. And uh, last question before I ask how people can get involved in your campaign. What are your thoughts on the Shrek movies, the, the, the franchise? <laughs> I like that. <laughs> You like them just generically? I don't. I watched the first one, but I don't really remember it. <laughs> I haven't watched any of the other ones. You're missing out. The... Shrek Two is probably the best one out of all four, and they're making a fifth one. Um, oh wow! I didn't even. So know sorry that, that, like... to watch the second one. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. You have you have a congressional race to work on yeah. right now. Oh, you guys! Can, uh, all of you, you met, can you watch all the Shrek Joshua movies. You like Shrek? Oh, canceled. Uh, Somebody canceled me for not watching Shrek. You guys are mean. She's running for Congress. She's busy. <laughs> She's busy right now. Um, we can get you to watch all the Shrek movies uh, from your apartment in DC once we elect you. But how can we get you elect? Well, maybe you won't have time. Maybe Shrek is just a lost cause for you, Rebecca. But, uh, but how can <laughs> we get involved uh, in your race? How can people get, uh, get involved with you? You can uh, donate. Um, a dollar helps. Anything you can give helps. Go to Rebecca. If you're over 18. What? If you're over 18, you can donate. Yeah. Sorry, what's the website again? Uh, Rebecca for WA.com. Awesome. Um, or if you're under 18, ask your parents to donate. Um, you can donate from anywhere in the country. Um, it affects you, you know, as a federal position. You know, I'm serving my constituents, but it affects the entire, um, it affects the entire country. And you can also volunteer from anywhere. Uh, phone banking, if you don't like... Um, cold calling strangers and you're an introvert, we also have outreach for introverts where you don't have to talk to strangers on the phone. Um, so you can sign up for that as well as go to Rebecca for WA.com to sign up and follow me uh, at Rebecca for WA on social media. Amazing. Awesome. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining me for this candidate conversation. I will be back on Friday for probably one of the ones that I'm most excited for ever. I'm bringing in Ed Markey uh, and I'm very excited for that. Uh, so tune back in on Friday. That's going to be at 5.30 uh, Pacific, 8.30 Eastern. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining me and good luck in your upcoming race. 
Thank you. Thanks for having me. You as well. Bye-bye.